I'm Alexander Rich. I'm going to tell you about experiments that uh, occurred during the early years of molecular biology. I was a postdoctoral fellow with Linus Pauling from 1950, 1949 to 1954. And during that period, uh, at the end of it, uh, he asked me to take X-ray diffraction photographs of DNA. Uh, <clears throat> the method for doing this is quite simple. DNA is usually a dry, fibrous material. You moisten it with water and put it on a glass slide. The glass slide is put on a microscope uh, bed and attached to the objective lens, you have a small, thin glass rod. And using the drive of the microscope, you lower the uh, glass rod till it touches this little gel-like material, and then you slowly withdraw it. And at the end, you're left with a glassy-looking fiber. <clears throat> Since DNA is very elongated, you hope to have the molecules parallel to each other. And <clears throat> using X-rays, which are simply short wavelength light waves, but with wavelengths uh, in the range of the distance between atoms, you get a diffraction pattern. And from that, you can infer something about the structure of the molecule. Um, Rosalind Franklin, working in England, carried out a very wonderful experiment in which she withdrew a fiber which was highly oriented and played an important role in allowing Watson and Crick to propose their double-stranded model of DNA in which the two strands are coiled around each other with the bases flat in the middle. The bases are what we call complementary. That is, adenine pairs with uh, thymine, and guanine pairs with cytosine. These bases stack on each other in the center. <clears throat> when, I, when I started working, the Watson and Crick paper uh, was published, and I could immediately see that this was correct. And <clears throat> I then asked myself the following question. <clears throat> at a, a meeting at Caltech, where both uh, all the DNA people were there, I asked myself, what about RNA? In RNA, you have the same four bases, except the thymine, which pairs with adenine, is usually replaced by uracil. But again, complementary. <clears throat> so after this meeting, I started working with RNA samples, withdrawing fibers to see if I could get an oriented pattern. Uh, Jim Watson, who was at Caltech at the same time, was interested in the problem, so we worked together on this. And <clears throat> during a good part of 1954, we photographed a large number of RNA preparations that we obtained from different people. All of them were frustrating they did not show evidence of orientation. And so we could not say whether 
it could form a double helix or not. Uh, a year uh, in 1954, at the end, I went to NIH to set up my own lab and continued working on this problem. Uh, around that time, methods were made, uh, enzymes were isolated, namely by uh, Severo Ochoa and Marianne grunberg Monago, which isolated an enzyme which would take ribonucleotides and polymerize them into chains. So you could make polyriboadenylic acid and polyribouridylic acid. I studied these uh, compounds uh, together with uh, David Davies, who had joined me at uh, NIH, and we found they had very little organization within them, but <clears throat> uh, in early 1956, for reasons that were not very clear to me, I decided to mix together polyriboadenylic acid and polyriboadenylic acid. Immediately I noted that the gel became rather cloudy and much more viscous. And so I put the glass fiber in and carefully withdrew a, uh, a fiber of the uh, nucleic acid and <clears throat> put it in the x-ray beam and to my astonishment there was the diffraction pattern of a double helix. Not the DNA double helix, a slightly different form. And <clears throat> we then carried out several analyses of this and what we concluded was that the molecules had found each other and combined to hybridize. We, the word hybridization was not used at that time. Uh, it was used later, but it was meant to describe the binding together of complementary uh, oligonucleotides complementary either DNA or RNA. Um, so all of a sudden, uh, we wrote up a short article for the a letter to the uh, Journal of the American Chemical Society describing this remarkable event that the, there were two issues here. One, could RNA form a double helix? The answer was definitively yes. Two, this remarkable phenomenon, phenomenon of the hybridization or spontaneous formation of a double helix from individual complementary chains. Uh, many people were very skeptical of that interpretation. Uh, partly they said, look, these chains are very long. They're likely to get entangled. How would, how would they untangle and combine? And two, these chains are all negatively charged. They have phosphate groups in them. How could those negative charges come together? Uh, and finally, three, a rather um, argue of an argument concerning thermodynamics. In general, things do not go from disorder to order. They go from order to disorder. How could this occur? 
Well, what was not obvious to everybody, but it became obvious to me after studying it, is that the people who uh, made these arguments did not understand the entropic, the randomization associated with shedding water molecules from these chains when they combined. And uh, now, what drives the phenomenon? What drives the phenomenon is the fact that these bases, adenine and uracil, or guanine and cytosine, they are essentially lipid soluble. They, they like to live in oils, not in water, because of their flat ring surface. And so what happens is you bring these together, forming a molecule, a double-stranded molecule, which is essentially oily in the middle. And that's a very strong force for bringing them together. Around that time, in 1956, uh, uh, there was a meeting in Baltimore of the McCollum Pratt um, <clears throat> dealing with genetics. And I presented this material. And at the end of my talk, a, uh, a middle-aged Englishman in a tweed suit came up to me and said, Professor Rich, I want to congratulate you. You've discovered molecular sex. This was Julian Huxley, a a science writer with a very vivid imagination. And uh, it was his way of describing the specificity of hybridization. The hybridization has become a major tool in the development of molecular biology. For example, a well-known reaction called the polymerase chain reaction in which you put together a system and essentially increase the amount of DNA starting from very little. This makes possible all kinds of uh, medical and uh, biological experiments possible. <clears throat> it is based on the combination of a single strand of DNA with a complementary small primer of 20 nucleotides or so. That combination occurs spontaneously because of hybridization, and it allows the whole process to continue. The <clears throat> it's very difficult to underestimate the extent to which hybridization dominates uh, a great deal of the developments that have been at the basis of molecular biology. They're used extensively and are used broadly and uh, are still so today. Thank you.